So guys, the BrewDog Distilling Co. Distillery, um, we are super passionate about the fact that we make absolutely everything from scratch, okay? That means the raw materials coming in are grain, molasses, you name it, we will try and process it to create flavor uh, through the distillation process. The Lone Wolf Gin that we're gonna be tasting together a bit later on, it starts its life actually in one of our world-class breweries, which is that away. And uh, we start with four ingredients. We start with malted barley, yeast, water and malted wheat and the guys will ferment that just like they would a beer for about seven days after seven days we have an alcohol uh, an alcohol basically a strong beer that is not hot it's around about 10 percent, and we're going to bring that into the distillery and we're going to start to concentrate flavor but we're also going to uh, concentrate alcohol ethanol so to be legally allowed to call our spirit a vodka, we actually have to reach 96% ABV. So that's 10 to 96. How do we do it? We start in this guy over here, the world's only triple bubble still. Uh, this is a pot still with an eight plate rectification column next to it. Uh, we use steam to heat the contents of the pot up. Alcohol is gonna boil a lot quicker than water will. Uh, it boils at 78 degrees Celsius. So the vapor from the, al the alcoholic vapor is gonna rise up it's going to go through each of the, the bubbles. Bubbles are super important. Copper is a magnificent metal, which is a, um, a purifying, has purifying qualities. So when it comes in contact with our spirit, it uh, does an amazing job of softening it, actually sweetens it a little bit as well. So when we uh, have all these uh, bubbles, these three bubbles, we over accentuate the, the copper contact and we just get a really, really clean spirit out of the out of the still. The column, which kind of looks like a flute, um, this column is going to be responsible for taking our alcohol all the way up to 90%. So after about six hours of distillation, we have about 250 liters of uh, alcohol in the tank below. We're gonna repeat the process six times. After we've distilled uh, our high strength beer six times, we're gonna transfer it into this still here, the spirit still. And we're gonna do exactly the same thing, okay? The difference though this time, when we add the steam and then the alcohol starts to evaporate, it's not going into an eight plate column. It's not going into this guy. It's actually gonna be going into a much taller, grander and uh, taller plate, uh, taller column. So we'll take a walk over to it. This column, is 60 plates high and it's 18.5 meters tall okay at the top of that column we will achieve 96 percent abv spirit which is legal legally called a vodka i've got some coming out right now so super smooth yes in case it's a, it's a bit fiery it's 96 percent super smooth balanced sweet and uh, it doesn't have that ethanol heat that you get when you know you drink a, a cheaper uh, cheaper vodka ours is all about do we all we focus on doing all the hard work up front through the brew house the distillation process to make sure that you know we don't have to filter the vodka at the end of it so after the vodka has been distilled we can do one of two things one it will go into a bottle as our rogue wave vodka or it will go into our gin still and our gin still is in the corner here. Six hundred liter gin still. And you can see we've got we've actually got some Lone Wolf Cloudy Lemon gin that's uh, been distilled at the moment. So in there we have all of our Rogue Wave vodka, and we've all, we've also got fourteen of our specifically chosen botanicals. When the distillation is ongoing, what the vodka is doing is it's it's basically. Uh, removing all the essential oils from the botanicals. It's taking them out of the, uh, the skin of the, the lemon, the skin of the grapefruit, the skins of the juniper. It's boiling those. They are going to rise up and they'll end up in the condenser. If you want to come a bit closer here, you'll be able to see that we have gin flowing out the top. This is about 74%. At the beginning of the distillation, which is where we're at now, we got heaps and heaps of citrus flavor. So this just smells like lemon, limoncello, um, and a hell of a lot of grapefruit as well. It's super delicious. Now, we obviously make multiple different styles of gin. 
We've got our Zealot's Heart, which is a big old juniper forward gin, which we add about two times the amount of juniper that we would for our lone wolf. We've got the Cloudy Lemon, mentioned the Cactus and Lime that we've, uh, we're going to launch uh, in, the, in the next month as well. Uh, but this still can be super versatile as well. So 500 cuts. The botanical distillation for that, that recipe, which is orange peel, uh, clove, mace, cinnamon, that happens in there as well. So what's really cool about this distillery is it's the fact that it's so agile. We can make any style of spirit that we want, from rum to gin to vodka to whiskey to different styles of whiskey, bourbons, grain styles. Uh, we can do absinthe if we want. We can do brandy. It's absolutely unlimited, the, the, uh, the styles of liquid that we can, we can produce. Over here, we've got some botanicals that have been prepped for the distillation that will happen tonight. So we've got Thai lemongrass, we've got kaffir lime, we've got lavender in there. Let me dig out the citrus at the bottom. So we've got heaps of fresh citrus. We don't use dried peel, really important. Citrus always, have, well for us, must be uh, whole peel when we put it into the still because the oil content is just so much, much more uh, than if it was dried. Um, over here, we have our citrus supply. <laughs> So we use fresh lemons for absolutely everything that we do. The cloudy lemon gin, we use 18 kilos of um, Sicilian lemons per batch, okay? And that means that, uh, you can't see it right now, but um, our, our fingers in the distillery typically have a couple of uh, nicks and cuts on them because we're, we're constantly peeling. Uh, grapefruit um, is the backbone of our, our lone wolf gin in terms of citrus. Um, and it plays a massive part of the, the, uh, the aroma profile when we get it into a gin and tonic. So without further ado, we have our Lone Wolf bottle. So at this point, if you guys have a Lone Wolf in front of you, or if you have a, a glass to hand, get some Lone Wolf in there if you've got a bottle. Hannah, do you want to go around that seat? Cool. And what we're going to do is we're just going to do a tutored tasting of this delicious gin. We took 192 attempts. That makes me sound either incompetent or like a perfectionist, <laughs> but it was a labor of love. And um, we did a massive amount of research into like, where is the best juniper grown in the world? Is it Italy? Is it the UK? Is it Scandinavia? Is it Canada? And we took juniper from all around the world. And we found that by distilling it just alongside our roadway vodka, uh, the, the flavor profiles of the juniper were completely uh, different depending on where it was grown. Italian juniper is king. It is absolutely amazing. It's so uh, densely packed with oils that we just get an amazing profile uh, that sits head and shoulders above every other botanical that's in the gin. We also supplement that juniper with Scots pine. And this is a really important uh, link to Scotland. So juniper and pine from the same family uh, so we add fresh pine needles to the gin to, uh, to kind of complement the, 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 the heavy juniper flavors that we've got uh, from the juniper. Um, next, the most important secondary component is citrus, okay? I'm a, I love classic gins, but I love intensity of flavor. And that's what we've tried to do with this gin. It's all about juniper and pine up front, citrus coming from lemon and grapefruit, and then all the other botanicals, which is about another 10. So things like green cardamom, mace, angelica root, orris root, uh, lavender. These are what we call complexity builders. They're not designed to be the star of the show. They're not supposed to be the only thing that you can uh, taste, uh, but they're in there to just build balance and complexity. So I'll open this guy up. Amazing. I'm gonna put some ice into this as well. 50 mils. Okay, so whenever I do a tasting of anything, beer, spirits, uh, you name it, your nose will tell you a hell of a lot more than your palate will. Okay, this is really important. So you can only taste five flavors, um, but your nose can pick up so, so much more. So when it comes to aroma, get the nose right in the glass. Don't be, don't be shy about it. Immediately, heaps of juniper, it's just waves of juniper, um, and the Scots pine is kind of lurking in the background. 
kind of like a, almost like a menthol top note to the to the drink as well. Behind that, I get grapefruit before lemon. Um, some people get it the other way around, but grapefruit is what I get. And there's an earthy quality, which is coming from the angelica and the orris root. Um, obviously, gin isn't designed to be drunk neat, but there's kind of like a, for me, there's a staple three test that, it, that I always use to kind of make sure that a gin is top notch. One is, does it drink well on its own? And for me, the answer is absolutely. Second, how does it sit in a gin and tonic? Okay, and I'm really, really particular about gin and tonic, okay? So here is uh, my preferred way of drinking a gin and tonic. Treat a gin and tonic like cocktail, okay? Do not take a 200 ml bottle of tonic and just pour uh, till the bottle's empty. Why you shouldn't do that is because you will wash out the flavor of the gin. If you've got uh, one part gin in here, my recommended ratio, gin to tonic, is one part gin to three parts tonic. If that's a little punchy, go, to one, to, go one to four. But my preference would be one to three and not to, well, don't you hate it when someone, I do, when you're in a bar, bartenders uh, serves you a gin and then just proceeds to put all of the tonic in the, in the glass. Um, as I said, one to three is absolutely perfect. Um, garnish grapefruit is the, not the whole thing, but take a bit of grapefruit and then peel or wedge up to you. And then you'll see that the, the, the flavor profile is completely relaxed. So that intense juniper has been dialed back by the fact that we've diluted the drink, but it's super balanced alongside the tonic. Good tonics shouldn't overwhelm, they should complement the gin. Cheers, buddy. The other gin that we make is Cloudy Lemon. I touched on it a moment ago, but I want to talk about it because it's something we're super passionate about. These lemons uh, from Italy, uh, we peel by hand in the distillery and we add them to the Lone Wolf gin in a, in, a, in a giant tank. We let them steep for seven days. And then after that, we filter out the lemon peel and we have a beautifully cloudy, uh, aromatic, citrusy, zesty gin. The inspiration for this gin was uh, from one of our distillers, actually, uh, Daniele. Um, he is from uh, Italy and he visited home before Christmas last year. And when he came back, uh, he brought with him some kind of classic homemade limoncello. And we were thinking about innovations in gin and what we could do. And we did something, uh, it was a Friday evening, completely uh, relaxed in the distillery. We just kind of were shooting the uh, talking shop and we mixed up limoncello with uh, the low wolf gin and got heaps of ice in there, big garnish of lemon, and it worked so well. So it wasn't one of those innovation sessions where we sat down scratching our heads, thinking for ages. It was one of those completely organic, one of the distillers, super passionate about limoncello, and we just pulled it together. Uh, and if anybody fancies a little John to Ellen to help us peel some lemons, we would be super grateful. Okay, uh, guys, that is our virtual tour over. Uh, I hope that was super informative, super useful.